Great, thanks for having me. Uh, today we're going to discuss a project I've been working on for about the last year called ML2VR, providing MATLAB users an easy transition to virtual reality and immersive interactivity. So who here programs in MATLAB? Oh, this is going to be a tough talk. <laughs> Who here is interested in supporting other people who use MATLAB? Who's just waiting for the pizza for lunch? Okay, okay. Honesty. Um, yeah, so my name is David Zielinski. I'm currently at Duke University. Some of my other collaborators on this project are Ryan McMahon at uh, UT Dallas. Uh, Wenji Liu and Sylvia Ferrari are our other collaborators at Duke and they actually are, uh, do a lot of robotic kind of AI type stuff. Do I press this? Hey Bill, is there something I do with? Oh wait, it just did something. Oh wait, no. I can just say next too. <laughs> just click which one? Okay. Okay, so let's talk about the motivation for why we did this project. So at Duke we have the dive, which is called the Duke Immersive Virtual Environment. It's a six-sided cave type virtual reality system. You can see a very old photo of me there when we <laughs> first started the system, but this is kind of a view of the system. There's one wall on the door that kind of slides open and closed. This is how you actually get into the system. The rest of the walls are fixed. They're actually kind of a floppy screen material. The floor and the ceiling are kind of a rigid plastic. Uh, the trick of actually how it projects from the bottom is actually there's a projector underneath here that's shining up underneath. Any questions? Okay, so that's our system. Um, one of our motivations would be, you know, the benefits of using virtual reality. This is a whole topic unto itself, but I'll just list a couple of key reasons why somebody who's not yet using virtual reality might want to use virtual reality. Uh, one of them is there's this concept that we can represent models to scale. Uh, if you imagine you're looking at some sort of new car you're designing, if you have to look at that on the desktop, you're going to be looking at an image that's actually four or five inches big. However, if we look at it in a virtual reality environment, we can, there's a lot more flexibility with the scale, especially when we have a completely immersive system like this. Uh, there's also been some uh, benefits of virtual reality research that shows you get increased spatial understanding. Uh, kind of paired with the advanced uh, visual immersion, there's also usually advanced interaction techniques present in the dive or in virtual reality systems. Uh, the last talk we talked, heard a lot about the difference between the mouse, you know, as a two degree of freedom device versus the wands, which are considered a six degree of freedom device. Basically, six degree of freedom device to recap is kind of a position, so an X, Y, Z anywhere in space, or that orientation anywhere on its three axes. Uh, you can also even go further these days with things like the Kinect that use full body tracking, um, or even another area of uh, virtual reality uh, that we're just starting to get involved with at Duke, which is brain computer interfaces. Um, Okay, and one last re thing about virtual reality, and this is maybe more particular to the type of system we're using, which is in these cave type systems, uh, they're usually big enough that you can fit a bunch of people in there. Usually we do about four or five people in our system at a time. And even though the viewpoint is being generated from a single head position, we find that as long as you're kind of near the head, you can still get some of the experience. So this is one of the other, uh, advantages of a cave system. Okay. Uh, next. <laughs> okay, so uh, we just described why we might want to use 
virtual reality because we have this cool system called the dive and virtual reality gives us things that we can't get from desktop systems. Uh, our other motivation for the project is uh, our dive system happens to be located in the School of Engineering. Turns out there's a lot of engineering students uh, around our building that are not using the virtual reality system. So our dream or our motivation was, is there a way that we can get the engineering students that are present in our department utilizing our dive virtual reality system? So that made us ask ourselves a question. What software do engineers use for simulation and modeling? Anyone? <laughs> What's that? Um, the answer is actually MATLAB. <laughs> and uh, this may be a little bit of a unique situation, but Duke actually has a site license for MATLAB. Uh, MATLAB is normally an expensive uh, product. There's a bunch of add-on toolboxes that make it more expensive. But because that cost is basically invisible to all the students and staff, at least at Duke University, there's a very high adoption rate of people utilizing MATLAB for their simulations. In a, if you didn't have that, there are some other systems that people use that are more open source, like Octave and R, but we'll maybe mention that a little later in the talk. But, so at least for Duke University, we found that a lot of the engineering students and staff on their day-to-day -day desktop lives were utilizing MATLAB. So I went to Wikipedia, which is my source for all knowledge, and asked it, what is MATLAB? And it says, MATLAB is a numerical computing environment and programming language developed by MathWorks. MATLAB allows matrix manipulations, plotting of functions and data, and implementation of algorithms. So this is kind of a screenshot of your typical MATLAB desktop experience here. You can see you can have a 3D plot here. These are kind of your directories. Uh, down here is the interactive window. So the important thing to remember is that MATLAB, you can kind of input commands one at a time interactively. So you can type in one plus two, enter, and get a result back. You can also store sequences of these commands that then makes up a program which are stored in a .m file. So the .m file is basically the script or the program file when you want to run a sequence of commands. But there's also plenty of people that just use it interactively to try out different ideas of you know, multiply this matrix times this other matrix. And okay, next. So before uh, re always heading down the path of immediately reinventing the wheel, we decided to at least look around a little bit. And actually, I have uh, one more I need to add to this. Uh, we looked around for some potential existing solutions. One of them is that MATLAB does make an additional toolbox that does some of this functionality. It allows users to create and modify VRML scene graphs. However, we decided we weren't really interested in this because a lot of their uh, tools here to view those scene graphs were really targeted at desktop display systems and we wanted something that would support our immersive cave type system. Uh, it's not on the slide here, but one of the other reasons too is that this Modifying these VRM, VRML scene graphs uh, requires a whole different set of commands and functions that we found many of our, the engineering students and staff just didn't even know this existed. So we wanted to support the functions and the visualizations that they were already utilizing and trying to minimize how much extra we were asking them to learn. Okay, uh, at Duke right now, we kind of have three main software libraries we're supporting. We're supporting Virtuals, which we use for a lot of our 3D game type stuff. That's where we bring all of the workflow for that is what we usually go from Maya into Virtuals. So a lot of our models, a lot of our archaeology stuff, that's the workflow into Virtuals. Uh, for uh, so far the medical visualization we've done, we do through a commercial program called Aviso right there. And uh, Aviso also has an add-in plugin that allows you to run MATLAB scripts inside of Viso to process data. So we thought about doing this, but part of the problem is it's really intended to just take 
pass in some data that's inside of Viso, do some calculations on it, and pass that data back out. So it's a very useful tool for people looking to extend their Viso simulations, but it wasn't that kind of drop in, take an already running desktop simulation that's already rendering some objects and have it work in our dive system. So we had to keep looking. Uh, the next thing we kept looking at was uh, Chromium, which is an open source project. It helps uh, capture and distribute OpenGL to render nodes. Uh, it, use, it utilizes an OpenGL intercept technique, which we're going to talk a lot more about in a second. Uh, but some of the problems with this is there's no input device abstraction layer, meaning that there's not really a good notion of the head and wand tracking. Another thing I ran into right away, and maybe this is just me being lazy, but I wasn't even able to get Chromium to compile. It's a little bit of an older project, so I ran up into some... Uh, blocks right away. So we liked that technique, but we decided to keep looking for other uh, libraries to analyze. So the last one there, the third library we kind of support at Duke is an uh, OpenGL C++ library called Syzygy. Uh, it provides kind of a familiar glut style callback. So as the programmer, you have an update world function where you process any of the inputs from the wands, and then you have a display callback where you draw your whole world. So as long as you're familiar with that kind of method of programming, it's not too hard to write programs in Syzygy. It doesn't really impose, at least from what I've been hearing, some of the higher level framework that something like Verui would. So uh, Syzygy is nice because it provides us our input device uh, abstraction layer, which means it doesn't matter what kind of tracking system we're using to the programmer, and it provides a display abstraction layer, so it doesn't matter where our screens are, how many screens we have, this is all specified in an XML configuration file, so to the programmer, what your actual geometry of your screens is invisible. So, you know, we liked that, but the problem is Syzygy is a C++ library and targeted at people who are going to write an application in it, in C++, and there's no way to obtain MATLAB's graphics into the Syzygy system. So we decided to kind of combine some of the features. Oh yeah, next. So our solution, since we decided that none of the existing solutions would really work out for us the way we wanted, that we would actually create a middleware software system, which we're calling ML2VR. So on the front end, in this case, is MATLAB, our software system kind of sits in the middle, and on the back end is Syzygy, which handles all of the opening windows and rendering type stuff. Okay, next. Let's see ML2VR in action. Oh, I forgot to tell you about this, but can we go to YouTube and type in ML2VR? Yeah, I don't have it embedded in the thing. That's fine, there's no audio in the, in the thing. Yep. Uh-oh. Maybe just on this one, it's a Windows machine, I think. It might be able to play it. No YouTube videos. Yes, there's some questions. Uh, we actually did not explore too much of the MATLAB in Aviso stuff, uh, mainly because we felt it was going to require too much of teaching the users how to utilize the kind of structures in Aviso. Mm -hmm. I think what's happening is from what I've looked at it is there's this, uh, it's spawning off a process every time you run it. So I'm not sure it's how it's running in between. 
It's because it's called, I think, I don't, I really don't know the back end of it, but I think what's happening is that it's call, causing, ah, it's calling the MATLAB interpreter, specifying the .m file, passing its inputs in, and then getting the inputs back out. Oh yeah, we, we did think about going that route, but we found this to be more. Okay, sure. Let's watch the exciting video of what we were able to achieve. Oh, I can narrate. So the user examines Surface with standard MATLAB desktop interface. So there's a picture of a user sitting in front of a computer. You can see that they're still able to, just using the built-in kind of controls, flip the object around, rotate it around. So now we're going to utilize ML2VR to examine the Surface in immersive virtual reality. So we get high fidelity interaction through head-based rendering and six degree of freedom manipulations. Okay, so our case study, which we'll talk about in a bit and then show later on once we switch to the demo portion. This is kind of the desktop version that our collaborators brought to us see that robot's trying to reach the red goal. It can be blocked by kind of these blue targets. So this was kind of our case study of can we actually use ML2VR to take a desktop MATLAB application and bring it into the dive. So now you see the result here. We're hanging out in our dive system. We're able to pick up the obstacle, move it around to really make that robot angry. Okay, so that's the video. Now that we've shown what we've achieved, let's discuss more, if everyone's still interested, in how we achieved it. So let's move to the next slide on the yes yeah, so let's explain some background material that will make some of our design decisions make more sense one of those is to understand some of the various VR system topologies that can exist so um, my collaborator on this project Ryan he's at University of Texas at Dallas he has one computer going into one HMD hanging out here um, Indiana there's a one CPU which will power four projectors. Each wall kind of gets its own graphics output from the computer. I guess in this case they're actually quadruplexes. And then there's our system at Duke University which is we have one CPU for one projector. So at least in this four wall example you can see that we're going to need a cluster of computers. So kind of supporting this additional level of supporting a system that was clustered because that's what our system was, was an important design consideration in how we structured the system. Okay. Who here knows what OpenGL is? Okay, not everyone, so I'll still go over the slide. Once again, uh, Wikipedia comes to the rescue and lets us know that OpenGL is an API, application programming interface, which is basically a list of functions we can call for rendering 2D and 3D computer graphics. The API is typically used to interact with a GPU, which is a graphics card, to achieve hardware accelerated rendering. OpenGL was developed by Silicon Graphics in 1992. So let's take an example of what would typically translate here. So if we're in MATLAB, one of the commands we can call is a fill3 command. So this just lets us draw polygons in that figure window that we saw at the very beginning of the talk. Okay, so let's say we're trying to draw this shape. We're going to pass it in some x, y, z coordinates to specify the vertexes, vertices, or the corners of the object. So in the underlying MATLAB code, that fill3 command, which is what the user typed into the interactive interpreter, 
actually will get turned into a sequence of OpenGL commands. So when we're talking about the OpenGL API, OpenGL commands, these are some of them. We have GL begin to specify what type of object we want to draw. We pass it in some of those vertexes or, or corners, and then we say we're done with that sequence of uh, geometry. Then what actually pops out on the screen is we actually get our nice shape. It draws that based on those, the information passed in there. Everyone understand OpenGL now? OK, so let's move on. So I mentioned earlier in the talk that we really liked the idea of the OpenGL intercept. What does OpenGL intercept mean? So what we do is we add our replacement OpenGL 32.dll. Uh, that's in the case of a Windows app. In a Linux app, it's actually libgl.so or some other variant like that. But basically, we're utilizing the behavior that when, uh, when the applications run, they'll look at what is in their home directory first before they go out searching all of the system files. So we can basically force MATLAB at runtime to load our OpenGL dynamically linked library, which just means that it's a series of functions that aren't an executable. So it's, a, it's not, a, the DLL is not a self-contained thing and it's meant to be loaded into another program and it holds the functions. Um, let's see. So when MATLAB calls an OpenGL function, our function that we've defined in this file actually gets called. So after sending out the data, we then pass the data onto the real OpenGL dynamically linked library so it still shows up on the master node screen. So let's, next, let's look at the sequence of events. So you can see here, let's say we do a MATLAB command. This is some sort of complex number of visualization that I don't understand. It is going to, calling this in the interpreter window will mean the underlying MATLAB code will call some G, OpenGL commands. The normal case will be here. It'll look up in that OpenGL32 DLL. It'll find the function and in that function there's some custom code to send that data over to the GPU and then bam, ends up on the screen. Next. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, yeah, okay. So that was the normal case here on the bottom. In the intercept case, we instead load our special DLL that we've made. First, we're going to send that data over the internet to our other nodes. And then we're going to call the real OpenGL DLL with the vertex so it still shows up on the screen. So you can see there, down to there, still ends up on the main screen. Any questions about the OpenGL intercept technique? Okay, next. So, let's talk about some system architecture challenges. One thing we ran into is that complicated MATLAB simulations may run at a low frame rate. Uh, I think Bill mentioned this just the other day that, you know, when you start to get below 12 frames, I'd say even below 20 frames, especially with head-based rendering, you start to get into a situation where you could develop things like simulator sickness very easily, just kind of a motion simulator, uh, motion sickness type effect. Uh, I also typed in interaction latency into Google image search, and this is what came up, which is uh, an interesting example of what happens when you have interaction latency. So interaction latency is if your program is running at a slow frame rate and it's only taking stock of what the user's inputs are, let's say once a second, the user could actually press a button or release a button in that time and maybe in this case they were trying to dodge our enemy here and somehow mess up the timing of that and this is going to lead to user frustration. So we just wanted to think about how can we minimize simulator sickness, interaction latency, if our MATLAB simulation, because it's doing complicated stuff, is running at a slower frame rate. So the way we think about this is, our Syzygy application that we're going to write, uh, in the demo we'll see in a second, we actually are using FreeVR as a back end, is viewed as the content viewer. And that runs at a high frame rate. So we asked ourselves, can we utilize this frame rate mismatch of the viewer running at a high rate, because all it's doing is displaying the geometry data, 
and MATLAB, which is basically generating and processing the simulation. Next. <coughs> so let's look at the most confusing slide in the talk. This is the detailed system architecture slide. So over here is the user's MATLAB script. We already talked about the intercept handler. And you can see here, just on that other slide, some of the information will go to the desktop display. Well, all of the information will go to the desktop display, but some of it will also get passed over to our Syzygy application. Um, there's also the interface server here. And this is actually, we're going to get to in a second, this is actually how the MATLAB user gets a lot of interaction device information, what buttons were pressed, where the wand position is, where the head position is. So we're going to cover this top interface section in another slide. For now, we'll just talk about what we do with that data once we receive it. So basically that data, the intercept handler sends out a copy to each node in our system. Once it's received that data, it sends a single one byte message to the Syzygy master node, which says, I'm ready to swap. The swap manager, once it's determined that all of the nodes are ready, it then, there's a shared variable mechanism in Syzygy. It tells everything to swap. And then th that's kind of the secret of what causes them all to swap at one time. It's kind of this careful mechanism here. Okay, so let's look at the next slide. Interaction latency, yeah. So let's also talk about a detailed system timeline of what would happen. So the MATLAB simulation generates content. You can see here it's generated one frame of content. In here it's doing processing, trying to figure out the next frame of the simulation. Uh, one of the things we did to try to deal with simulator sickness is we actually decoupled the head-based rendering from the simulation. So while Syzygy is waiting for the next frame to come in from MATLAB, we're actually able to look around the object from a different perspective at a very high frame rate. So kind of, this is one of the things when we're, with our design challenge of the simulator sickness that we were hoping to help eliminate. So we figured out a way to have fast head-based rendering. Okay, next. Okay, so now let's take a look at what an actual MATLAB script would look like. We only had two people here who actually do MATLAB, right? Anyone? MATLAB? Okay, we got three? Four? No? No? Okay, well, you're all going to learn MATLAB right now. <laughs> we're, not, we're not breaking to lunch, so we're all experts at MATLAB, right? No, okay. Anyway. It's a very, it's very, uh, you know, C, Java-like kind of uh, functional type programming. So it's not too hard to understand this, even if you don't know the exact syntax of MATLAB. So the one, the thing I want to illustrate here, though, is um, what we had to add in to our existing program to make it kind of virtual reality enabled. For just the graphics, we don't actually have to add anything into our program because that all just happens through the OpenGL intercept. However, if we want to start to get reactions from the user, we actually do need to add in some lines of code to our program. So one of the things that we provide in the software package is the VR interface. And so this actually encapsulates or hides all of the socket kind of ethernet calls that are happening behind the scenes. So the user's totally unaware of that. All they have to say is what piece of information do they want to get. So in this case, uh, this is just one of the API of ML2VR, API functions, which is get button event. And in this case, it will return an event code, either if there's nothing, one if there's a press, two if there's a release, a button number, and um, this actually I should explain for just a second which is one of the other ways that we tried to deal with interaction latency is we provided not just polling uh, functions, which would be getting the instantaneous value of the buttons or the head tracker, but at least for some of the stuff like buttons, we have this notion of events. And what that is, is when the user presses a button to say they want to do something, it queues up into a queue of events that the user pressed the button, 
we actually also store the wand position. So we found this to be very important that when you're running a slow frame rate sim simulation, when you finally lined up to where you want the wand to be, you want to press it and lock in that position. Uh, I forget the exact technical term, but there's actually a bunch of effects of when you pull a trigger uh, of any sort of device, you actually your hand moves a little bit. And this is actually a common interaction problem that would be only exacerbated if we're only sampling every two seconds of what the user's doing. By the time the simulation asks for what's happening, the hand might have drifted a little bit. Anyway, so this is just one of the API functions. In this case, in the program, we're going to determine if there was a button press, button zero. If so, we're going to modify our data. Then down here, we're just going to use all built-in MATLAB commands to render to that 3D figure window. In this case, we can clear the figure, we can do a surf command, and then we do a draw now, which is kind of the equivalent of doing a flush. So everything on the screen will be drawn out. And I actually didn't show it on here, but the other thing is uh, to draw multiple objects, you actually have to call another thing called hold on, and that allows you to accumulate multiple objects on the screen. So does anyone have a question about the MATLAB programming, which we're now all experts in? Okay, next slide. So let's talk about all of the API. Well, this is most of it. Uh, just to give you a feel for some of the functions that are available to the MATLAB script writer to be added into their existing MATLAB simulation. So we saw before we need to establish a connection to the MATLAB interface server, or to this, our interface server. Uh, the interesting thing about this, if you're wondering about some technical stuff, MATLAB actually does support object-oriented programming. So that's actually how I'm doing this, is I'm creating an object VR that then holds all of the data and functions inside of it. So once we've created that VR object that's connected to our server, we can set a couple of things. One of them is there's this notion of a return type in our system to make it easier. We decided the two return types are POS3 which is just an X, Y, Z, uh, three floating point ver uh, values. Another one is, uh, you can see down here, is a matrix four. So that is a way to get back, especially the wand or head position. It gives you a four by four matrix, which from that you can determine the position and orientation. Okay, uh, another important function was the set transform matrix. So a lot of times the MATLAB simulation is running in some weird scale like 50 units wide or something, or it might be way too small, way too big. Using the set transform matrix allows us to either move the object around in the world so it's the correct position inside our immersive system, or changing its scale. So we talked a second ago about the event methods, get button and get joystick. Uh, and then we have our three polling methods, which gets back, gives back the instantaneous value of where the user's uh, in this case, sensor is would where the head would be or where the wand would be. The get button or any of the buttons on our controller and the get joystick state would be the up and down, left and right on the joystick. Uh, and what these are actually mapping to is actually all determined in the Syzygy configuration or in the case of our newest backend of FreeVR, the FreeVR configuration file. Okay, any questions? Okay. Okay, so we already saw our case study, our robot path planning. You can see our desktop example here, bringing it into VR. Uh, it's an artificial potential function to plan the motion of the robot. Potential function recalculates the best, best path to the target. And we basically showed that we could add in ML2 VR functions to make the simulation interactive in our immersive space. Uh, these are our two collaborators that we mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Okay. Next. Uh, next slide. Or I can get out the whiteboard and start drawing. Oh. 
Okay, so since you saw that, since we did that video, which is now like two or three months ago, we have some new features, which are we can move all of the obstacles, but we can even move the goal. This makes the example, which we'll look at in a second, much more exciting, because it means even if the robot reaches the goal, we can still continue exploring its behavior. Uh, we also created a second example. Uh, kind of there's two techniques that we have for the robot example. One of them is the virtual hand technique which means you make contact with the object and then can press a button to virtually grab it. It's under your control as long as you're holding down the button. The other technique that we, interaction technique that we're demonstrating here is ray casting, which is a laser pointer metaphor. So shooting out from your hand is this laser pointer and if it intersects with the object, you can press a button and then once again virtually have it under your control. Okay, next. Okay, uh, we also have expanded the demos into looking at two scientific visualization examples, which we'll look at in the demo section of the talk. One of them uses this cone plot thing, and I think this is a perfect example of uh, when having immersive 3D is really important, and that is when you're looking at these dense data sets, they look like a total mess squashed onto a 2D screen. Whereas looking at this in 3D actually is a little bit more manageable. Uh, and down here on the bottom, we actually showed our kind of rainbow spike demo, but now we show using the joystick access control to actually modify in real time the mathematical equation that is being used to render this function. So one of the interesting things that you can do with MATLAB is changing the functions of what you're rendering very easily. Okay. Interaction examples, which we'll go through. Maybe some, maybe not, because it seems like there's not a lot of MATLAB programmers here. We might skip just to the scientific viz and the robot demo, because some of these are kind of uh, tedious, where I show you, this is all included in the distribution of the system, but basically I show you exactly how to do, have an object follow the wand around. So we've got click, which means press a button, Joystick using the left to right up and down. Got touch, just testing if you're within, in this case it's with when you're within the radius of the object. Drag follows the object around either just with position or with the matrix four, position and orientation. Virtual hand uh, combines a, a lot of those first couple techniques where once you make, con once you touch the object, then if you click the object, then it goes into a drag where it follows the hand around until you release the button. Then there's ray casting, which we talked about a second ago. There's also a cool demo maybe we'll show to you, uh, Sphere Spawner, which just lets you drop little spheres anywhere around the world. Um, this is cool too because it shows that, you know, the fact that we're redrawing the frame in MATLAB, we're not really limited to having some sort of pre-made world where we're just modifying the coordinates of the balls. We can, in the new frame, we can pop up any objects or disappear any objects. We're not limited in that sense. And then there's an example of polling, and I don't think navigation is working yet in FreeVR, so we probably won't show that one. Okay. Our contributions of this project are that we created an open source cross-platform software system. We actually worked hard to make sure it works under Windows and Linux. Uh, we have Mat we've shown that we have MATLAB scripts can easily obtain input device data by utilizing our provided VR interface. We decoupled to allow fast head-based rendering so the user can look around the object while they're waiting for the next simulation update. We showed our successful case study of a desktop to VR conversion with the robot demo. And we've provided a suite of interaction programming examples for people that already program in MATLAB but want to add in the interaction code to their simulations. Okay, next. So it turns out March is ML2VR month. I gave a talk on this. We have a local uh, kind of weekly seminar series, the Friday Forum at Duke. I gave it there. They had a poster session the next week. I was actually just last week down in Orlando, Florida. I presented this work as a poster at the IEEE VR 2013 conference. And now I'm a speaker at the Immersive Visualization Boot Camp. Okay, next. So, future work, software robustness. I was really lazy uh, 
with the number of OpenGL primitives I've supported. This is one of the big differences between a really well done uh, commercial product. I recently saw a demo at IEEE VR TechViz. Very well done, very well implemented. Uh, it's really, I really looked at the printout, kind of the trace of the functions that I needed to do to support a couple of the more popular MATLAB commands, like the surf rendering command and the fill3 command. And I implemented in my code exactly the commands that would facilitate those demos. So literally, I think I'm supporting something like glbegin, glvertex, a couple of the different ones, glcolor, and glend, and that's it. So you can see that for a more uh, robust implementation of this, I need to support a lot more of the API commands. It doesn't make things horrible. Right now, the system just ignores them. But if you, think, if you want to put in things in MATLAB, which you can do, like lighting, textures, normals, a lot of those things right now are being ignored by my, by my code, which would be nice if it didn't. I'm telling you all the, dark, the bad side of what, <laughs> of what it, uh, ML2VR has. There's a couple of uh, static buffers that should really be dynamic. S there are some weird line rendering issues on uh, one of the plots that I need to look into. And the other thing we need to think about more is kind of our desktop simulator workflow. Right now I do have kind of a simple glut application that allows the user to move the mouse around, to move to simulate a six degree of freedom device. Uh, but kind of this workflow needs maybe to be better thought out. And uh, kind of the big question that when you're doing systems design like this that I know I certainly don't ask myself enough times, but I probably should get in the habit of doing, which is the evaluation question. Oh, I missed it. Which is, do we actually get a benefit of immersive visualization and interaction with our MATLAB uh, desktop scripts? Are our engineering students going to derive some value from this whole thing? We don't know yet. So our future work, um, these are proposed by our collaborators. One of them is the quadcopter simulation. We saw our kind of desktop robot example, and it was kind of boring because the robot is just going around on a plane. So in a sense, we ba I basically just showed you guys a two degree of freedom example. You know, how exciting is that? Not really. We can actually take advantage, though, of a six degree of freedom input device, in this case, being able to move those obstacles around the virtual world if we have a robot that also has a higher degree of freedom, that it's not tied to the ground plane. Uh, another really popular topic that uh, our collaborators are interested in is something called human robot collaboration simulation. So this is kind of one of the great uh, uses of virtual reality, which is that you can simulate devices buildings, whatever, that haven't even been constructed yet. So you can look at a building that hasn't even been built yet. You can also imagine looking at a robot that hasn't even been, that maybe we're not even able to design yet, but we're able to start working on the algorithms of how it would collaborate with the human. And we view this as something that we could do in an immersive type system, like our dive system. Okay. So uh, future work. In addition to trying to take care to really construct ML2VR to have a uh, cross-platform I mentioned a second ago, Windows and Linux. Also, we tried to really think about how this could be extended either on the front end. So right now we're doing MATLAB. I've had some people ask for R or Octave. I know Camille from University of Illinois really wants to get Mathematica working for this or at least borrowing some of these techniques. Uh, then on the back end, you know, at our system uh, at Duke, we're primarily using Syzygy, which works on uh, Linux, works on Windows. They say works on Mac OS. I've never tested it. Uh, but it also works on either HMDs, clustered computers, or single box computers that have a bunch of graphics cards. Uh, I've also been collaborating with Bill Sherman here. We've gotten... Uh, I would say a beta version of the free VR backend app working, which if everything is still working after I finished this PowerPoint, we'll take a look at some of the demos. And actually at the IEEE VR conference, I ran into Judy Vance, who's actually at the Iowa State. Uh, they have a six-sided cave system, and they primarily use VR Juggler, so she has some interest in perhaps getting a student of hers to work on a backend for that.
So in the year that we've been uh, working on ML2 VR, I've met some new people. One of them is Michael Gus Gustafsson. He act every engineering student at Duke actually has to take the computational methods in engineering, which is basically their programming course. Turns out that course is actually in MATLAB, which might explain why all of the students at Duke seem to know, at least all the engineering students seem to know some MATLAB. It's because they're forced to take it. Anyway, we're talking with him right now about how we can incorporate ML2VR either as a project inside of his class or as an independent study that he's going to host in the semester after his class. But this is a collaborator we're working on figuring out how we can uh, work with. I've also been talking with Ross Trednick, who I uh, got to hang out with at the IEEE VR conference. He actually d uh, does all the system work for the UW-Madison cave. and. We actually, as of January 1st at uh, Duke, we now have a new director. Uh, it's actually pronounced Hedges, even though it's written Regis, it's pronounced Hedges, Copper. And he's the new director of the dive. And uh, some of the strengths that he really brings to this project is he is really an expert at setting up user studies, statistics, evaluation criteria. So we're going to bring him into the project. Um, to really maybe address some of those evaluation questions. Okay, so that's me at the top, David Zielinski, Duke University, Ryan McMahon, Wenji Liu, Sylvia Ferrari. We also had some help uh, before she left Duke from Rachel Brady, my former boss. Uh, Eric Munson and Sarah helped out with some of the figures and pictures. And I was actually supported by the NSF to do this work. So you can also thank them for this project. So thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, this is the URL. You can actually look. That's the current version of the software. Although maybe wait a couple of days because I found a new bug when we were setting up uh, the free VR stuff uh, the other day. But there's uh, distributions of the source there. There's the link to the YouTube video, although it's pretty easy to find the YouTube video. Just type in ML2VR into YouTube. And uh, also, there's a link to a pretty good podcast, and then they also have this other lec uh, lecture capture system of that talk I did a couple weeks ago, pretty much of these same slides, but at Duke University. So if you just couldn't get enough of this, if you wanted to review it, the material more, or maybe if you have some collaborators and you want to just send them a link and say, hey, is this something you're even interested in, I would suggest uh, having them look at that talk link. Thank you. Maybe come back for demos afterwards. Yeah, let's, let's do that. And so uh, um, we'll come back up at 1.30, and so we'll shift things back a little bit, but I think that'll be Sure, yeah. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to look at uh, four of the different interaction examples, then we're going to look at those two visualization examples, and then two versions of the robot demo. In order to make all of this work, though, I'm going to need experimental guinea pigs to demo our system. So first, I'm going to flip through the code here for uh, virtual hand. So this is the, all of the code. It takes up a couple screens. But this is the code to do the virtual hand interaction inside MATLAB. So we set up a bunch of stuff here. Uh, the only thing that's a little bit weird, we already talked about the connection to the VR interface. One of the things I'm doing in a lot of my examples is I wrapped up one of the surf commands, which is the standard way to render stuff in MATLAB, but I wrapped it up inside this object that I call VR sphere. So that just lets me set the size and the position of it real easy, but it's nothing magical, but it is something that I'm providing and is not built into MATLAB itself. Okay. Do, do, do. So at the beginning of our loop, we do the standard thing. We check if the, for the button event. Then we compute the difference between the object and where the user is. If we're dragging, we set the position of the sphere. If we're not dragging, we determine if we've started a touch, if it's within the radius or not. 
We're actually going to change the sphere color to indicate whether we're touching or not as a feedback to the user. Uh, then this is the comp uh, looks a little bit complicated stuff, but this is basically where we're starting the drag. So we basically store where the user's wand is. So we get this drag difference number here. Change the color again to say that we're dragging or let go on the bottom there. And then this is just all of the code uh, to render it. You see we clear the screen. We're setting up kind of the axes and the orientation of the camera. Turning hold on, so if we're drawing multiple objects in MATLAB, that allows us to keep calling more different uh, surf commands, or in this case, render. And we call uh, our sphere inside this function. It just issues the surf command, and then we do draw now as like a flush out to the screen. Who wants to demo it? Somebody has to volunteer. Uh-oh, are we going to have to start doing gym class where I go one, two, three, four? <laughs> yes. Mm hmm Oh, I think looks like the tracking, I don't know. So much for testing it, right? <laughs> okay, and restart the free VR thing too, just to make sure it connects to the. Okay, so put on your glasses. Oh, <laughs> well, move a little to your left. Yep, there you are. So maybe stand back a little bit. I think you're right on top of it is why it's hard to do, yeah. Okay, so now touch, touch the sphere. Walk up closer to it. Yep. Now press the trigger underneath once you've made contact. Yep, now it's under, up. Oh, yeah, and hold it. Now it's under your control. Move it around. Oh, I should wear some glasses too. Oh, great. Everyone amazed at the uh, implementation of the virtual hand technique? Just a quick recap for in case people didn't see this. This is the entire code. We initialize some stuff. We're using our classic get button event, calculating the distance between the wand as a parameter. Then we're, uh, if we're not dragging, we try to determine if we're touching or not. In this case, we set it to green if we're touching. So it's blue normally when we're not touching. So go up and touch the, so just touch it. Yeah, it'll turn green. And that, when it's green, that means we can press the trigger underneath to initiate dragging, which is the code you see here. And then down here is the rendering code. Are we ready to move to the next example? Okay, let's move to example seven. So, what's that? Yeah, I won't go in as, because this one's actually pretty much the same, except for a couple of uh, one key change. Are you running, yeah, so twist, are you running number seven now? So grab it and do the virtual grab again. And then now try twisting your hand. No, we're still running number six. There you go. Uh, run number seven. Grab it and turn it. Yeah, so there you are. So this is the same example, but we're using the return of the matrix four instead of the pause three. So in this case, we're getting back the full four by four matrix from the sensor and piping that into MATLAB. You can see that our, the only thing that changes is our stuff to change the sphere. The math gets a little bit more complicated. I'm doing the current user position times the drag differential times the original stored transform. Okay. Let's move on to number eight.
Yeah, so control C, uh, Bill, control C, the one we're running, yeah, and then you can run the next, yeah, that's good. So this is the same example, but now with ray casting. So you can stand back from an object, it's using the laser pointer methodology. You can see there's, uh, the math starts to get a little bit more complicated here, but basically I'm doing, I'm taking that matrix four we got back to determine the forward vector where the user's pointing the wand. Uh, then we're doing a little bit of math that I did have to look up. I did not know that, but basically calculating the distance between the position of the wand line, the vector, and the point. So with a little bit of not too advanced math, we're able to do ray casting in our MATLAB example. Okay, let's move on to the sphere, sphere spawner. This is a fun one. Okay, so this one uh, is, you know, more dynamic. Every time that you, you press the trigger, it's going to, yep, and then move somewhere else. Yep, so we can lay points all over. So I don't want, I wanted to put this as one of the interaction examples just to make sure that everyone didn't think all we were doing was modifying one object. We can have a whole bunch of objects that we modify. In this case, we're dynamically creating a, our new MATLAB world. Let's see if I move here, you can see that when I'm doing the rendering for each frame, I just cycle through the array I've built up of all the spheres, which is my VR sphere class, and I call render on it, which issues the surf command for it. Okay, everyone amazed with the interaction? Oh, a question in the back. Uh, in this case, it's only looking for the event of a, of a press, uh, so it will only spawn it when there's the press. So you have to release it to get more. But you can see even adding on all these, the performance, you know, is pretty good. Uh, in, this, in this example, you can't because I wanted to keep the code here simple. But in some of the robot demos, I'll show you examples where you can move all of the objects in the world. So the answer is yes, we can move these also, but not in this example because I wanted to keep the code here simple enough to look at. Okay, so we've moved on to, so this one you can use the trigger to pull it, to move it up on the screen. Yeah, and uh, press the one and two buttons on the left to change the streamers on and off. Oh, I guess I don't have any, uh, whoops, so much for having code for that. Okay, yeah, so turn on the streamers. Yeah, now you can use the joystick left and right Yeah, to, yep, to move kind of one of the vectors. This is just a very simple example, but I'm using the built-in cone plot rendering function of MATLAB. As you can see, that's normally what we would just see on the desktop there, on over on the left screen there, but here we get to experience it in more of an immersive thing. Uh, there's not a lot more interactions in this than moving the joystick or picking it up, but you could imagine a more advanced example where you're clicking at regions of interest or specifying points using the wand. Who would like to see the next science visualization example? Got one vote, let's move. <laughs> One vote for, zero against, we're moving on. So this one we can move the, this is using a surf command, it's the famous robot, uh, rainbow spike that we saw in all of our videos. Uh, here now we're uh, demoing it live for you. And you can, yeah, you can use the left and right joystick to change the equation parameters. So in this case we're uh, in real time modifying the coefficients to the equation that is rendering the surface. Although I've never taken it that far before. <laughs> okay, who is ready to see the robot example? Oh, this time I got five votes. We're moving up. Okay, so this is our classic example. Now we can, this is using the virtual hand metaphor, so you're going to have to walk up and touch. That's the goal where the robot's trying to get to. Or you can, and so that's where it's trying to get, and then you can move the blue obstacles to block the robot from getting to where it wants to be. So this is kind of our case study example of what our collaborators provided to us as that desktop robot navigation example. And we showed that by adding in some of the ML2VR API functions, utilizing our OpenGL intercept stuff, we're actually able to write a MATLAB virtual reality simulation that's all in MATLAB. Okay, and the last example is the same thing, but using the ray type of interaction. The ray, uh, ray casting interaction, more useful when you have a larger world and you need to select objects at a distance. 
So we've seen four of the interaction examples, we've seen the two visualization examples, and we've seen the two robot examples of ML2VR. Does anyone have any questions or requests? Is anyone excited about this? Okay, that's good. <laughs> I think that's all I have, unless anyone has questions or comments. Yeah, uh, so I don't have the virtual hand, uh, so there's a couple things I didn't mention in my talk. One of them is I have a couple of automatic features you can turn on. One of the automatic features is a virtual hand that affects the whole world. I haven't, it should work on this if we turn it on, but I haven't tested it. But the other thing we can do is if just in startup mode or even while you're running, you can set the world transform. So that what, that's what lets you move the world around. Oh, I have a question over there, Bill. Oh, you mean the next presenter? Oh, you mean you want me to go by every example line by line until he gets here? Is that what you're selling, telling me? <laughs> We're going to learn MATLAB one way or another today. <laughs> Questions, comments? Is he still down in uh, eating pizza? I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, so I think everything is now working for Bill's free VR, the beta version of the back end for free VR. The only thing I need to add into it is I think there's a line or two I need to fix about enabling navigation. So I didn't uh, mention it in my talk, but there is one of the API calls to let you move around the world and let you virtually travel. Um, so I need to enable that. I might have to put it on. Put it on. Yeah, I so. Simon driving for you? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Eric? 